Okay, um, I think even by AA standards we should start. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Martin de Messonnier uh, to come to talk tonight in this series. Uh, and I'm going to ask Francesca Hughes to introduce her. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, this is the second lecture in the series, Reconstructing Her Practice. And I just want to announce something about the other lectures in the series. Um, Nazreen Siraji and Liz Dilla will be speaking next week. And the following week, Beatrice Colomina and Françoise Hélène Jorda. The Catherine Ingraham lecture on the 9th, which is next Wednesday, has been cancelled. Now, I'm delighted to have Martine here. She practices with Dirk van der Brande, who's also here in Belgium, near Brussels. They've worked predominantly on residential work, now have a commercial building on site, which is their first large building that you'll see tonight. And Martine teaches at the in Advanced Institute for Architecture in Ghent and is art architectural editor of Forum International, as well as running the practice. It's difficult to know how to introduce her work, and you'll understand it when you see it. She, or both of them, revel in the banal in the same way, <coughs> as Martine points out, as Hitchcock does. Elements such as doors, windows, and chimneys become very important in their work but I don't want to give the game away. So suffice to, so suffice to say that in this case, appearances not only can be, but are deceptive. Please welcome Martin de Mesne. Good evening. Um, my intention here this evening is to present some uh, eight designs within the context of gender which is the theme of a series of lectures and the book edited by Francesca Hutchess. Gender, gender can be a difficult topic, I thought, since I'm a female in the first place, and naturally here should be some clue in my work. As a practicing architect, my other me, I'm working around the modernist dilemma between form and function, a theme, however, which due to being endowed with many prejudices is too re restricted for architectural use and which I try to expand since to the more palpable matters of seeing and knowing. As turned out, these matters, form versus function, seeing versus knowing, can be very well adapted to what is male business on one hand and female business on the other. Form can be quickly labelled as male territory. So much appears from the ambivalent meaning of erecting something, which entails a movement from the inside out. Basically, Ram Colas described Manhattan as a spectacle of needles, being extrovert, empty structures which are in a constant state of rivalry. Opposed to form, one can allot to function some feminine qualities. Appropriate here, too, is the introduction of the kitchen as being one space in particular where the housewife has been traditional placed by men. What makes the kitchen so attractive is that it can be easily identified with taxonomy, being the study of lower species, vegetables, plants and fruits, as well as well with alchemy. This is a slide of uh, a film of Peter Greenaway, the thief, a cook, or a cook, a thief and his wife. One of the obstacles to understanding function as female territory is that since modern times the notion, the meaning of function has been displaced from dwelling to a far more abstract minimal consensus involved with dynamics, motion, rotation and machines in conformity with the Newtonian world picture, looking up to the sky. The kitchen is function par excellence, being involved with heat processes and allegorizing cold, frigid world scope. More important, since the kitchen is traditionally located at the rear side of the house, one enters without knocking, 
it makes a beginning to see function as a conceptive matter in contrast to form as a primary extrovert force. And thus, we have arrived at the main thes thesis which underlies all our projects and which deals with the unbalance between seeing, the domain that covers such notions as pure forms or pure intuition of forms, ideal forms, high art, and all what ac accounts for the geometrization of our universe, and knowing which entails space of a conceptual nature, space which is primarily demarcated by psychological barriers and thresholds. The, the dialectic problem involved with this seeing versus knowing team was to associate architectural language with it, one which is at the time language and not language. We found it in the topological play with prepositions, in, out, front, rear, un, under, which are often found combined, in the Dutch language at least, with architectural nouns such as door, window, wall and room, and which relates back to the title of this lecture, Rear Window. Since topology has a lot in common with the child's conception of things, I consciously want to stress here the, po the position of the child which within the female male female relationship prepositions are described in one of our dutch encyclopedias as local invariables that articulate the relationship between things people which include children and action this is a slide about topology and mathematics it shows how a piece <coughs> of cloth is turned inside out, inside out. Next I want to talk about the actual break between form and function. One of my assumptions is that in archaic times, times form and function, ground and elevation were one and the same substance. For a period of thousand years vernacular houses were built, demolished demolished and rebuilt on the same foundation. This leads through the countless accumulations of the blurring of the line, dividing ground from elevation. It's what I call the undivided space. The break between form and functions manifested itself first and ideo ideologically in the post-Renaissance times under impulse of the ongoing process of rationalization, only to gain large-scale proportions at the beginning of this century due to the Industrial Revolution, the disappearance of distances. An outstanding example in the modern architecture is Villa Savoie, which is cut loose from the ground. You can see that on the slides. Elevated and put onto pilotis. The picture upheld by Le Corbusier was the, the stern of the ocean liner Aquitania, a ship that sails on international waters. It has no stable <coughs> underground. In a different example, a house in Garches, one can find Le Corbusier experimenting with regulating lines and right angles on the elevations. See also Culling Rose article in the Mathematics of the Idle Villa. Whilst Beale in search for beautiful proportions conform with the geometrization of our universe. By the end of the 19th century, man had found himself at the brink of unraveling the secrets of life itself at the hand, at the hand of simple, timeless mathematical and reversible laws. It's clear that this attitude this entire preoccupation with seeing, for that's what it is, lapsed into architecture as well. Also, and importantly, the euphoria with the Industrial Revolution meant that the break between form and function was dismissed as a minor effect in the process of rationalization and standardization still to overcome. Nobody noticed within the broader context of society 
that this break took place at the advent of a far more fundamental schism between, indeed, seeing and knowing, as was laid there by the uncertainty principles of Heisenberg, quantum physics. Heisenberg showed that light can travel both in the form of a particle or a wave, that whenever one tries to measure the momentum of the particle in a given system, its velocity is deformed and reversely, whenever one tries to measure the velocity, the momentum is deformed. One and another means that the ideal to determine and comprehend it, to comprehend our universe at the hand of simple and reversible laws is forever lost. Another effect of quantum mechanics is that a particle can choose its own way, tested in the interference system. Important within our context here is that the discovery of the uncertainty principles was the result of a thought experiment fabricated in the closed context of the laboratory with the help of the matrix calculus and subsequently overthrew the autonomy of the visual and measurable Newtonian space-time continuum. In the meantime, still, the rationalization of architecture was in full development. The big issue in modern architecture was to introduce light and air and decentralization, the birth of the void, with the concept of the house. As a reaction against the romantic idea of the furnished, stuffy, hierar hierarchical, concentrated and spatially wasteful 19th century mansion. In modern spaciousness is expressed by displaying the longest measurable axis. For instance, the diagonal balustrade in Ver in Verzun Architecture. It's a period of the ideological purification. In the modern house, the bathroom becomes the most important space. Early 20th century is a period too when open gutters became overdomed, covered. A nice anecdote is offered by the sociologist Elizabeth Wilson at the end of the 19th century postcard showing a group of women visiting the underground gutters of Paris. Accordingly to Wilson, it illustrates the general attitude of males at the time to public between brackets women. The word public woman is coined in the 19th century and stigmatized every female who would go and or live without the male company in the city. Within that same attitude, all 19th century garden cities were both designed to keep women away from the city and close to the heart. This concept was simply taken over by the 20th century modern Unité d'Habitation. Back to our thesis, despite our articulation of the bathroom, the general trend in modern architecture was that function becomes gradually repressed. What is then ignored throughout the modernist fascination with one continuous open space is that spaciousness and largitude is also and primarily generated by crossing barriers, which the modern architects altogether had eliminated, and by the number of times one changes direction on, one on the way, <coughs> apart from effective distance. As an example stands the labyrinthine, labyrinthine structure. Often it is the subtle game of social hierarchy, the conflicts that arise out of it, but also the ignorance of conflicts, conflicts withdrawing in one's private room and slamming doors, what makes the business of habitation livable. Openness in the latter context is primarily associated with choice instead of light and air. It's only right after the Second World War that the belief in the great ideal and the great ratio 
eclipses in the great uncertainty, with a sudden revival of function as one of the most important effects. It's in this period that post-war modern architecture, and I stick here to Le Corbusier's buildings, is dismissed as consciously striving to imperfection after Nicolas Pevsner on Ronchard and Labyrinthine after a saying of Alan Cahoon on La Tourette. A typical example is the monastery of La Tourette, where circulation runs through narrow corridors in order to discourage communication, only to end up in the main functions, namely refectory, library, church, and church, being all resort of meditation, rest, and study. <coughs> This is the refectory of uh, La Tourette. Their rule of St. Augustine is clear. As long as you sit down at the table, until you stand up again, listen to the regular reading without sound and dispute, for you shall take in nourishment not only through your mouth, but your ear also shall be hungry for the wor words of God. The fact is that La Tourette is indeed experienced as labyrinth time and inaccessible to the outsider. However, functions perfectly for the monks and accordingly to the code of the Dominicans. The post-war revival of function covers only a brief moment in time at the advent of the information age, considering the flight that the media has taken since the 60s the, fascin the fascination with seeing is more conspicuous than ever. The broadening of the early modern perspective and where the spectator was still associated with a route to be traveled, a promenade to the late modern panorama has only resulted in the reduction of the dynamical position of the architectural tourist to an inert position, standing on an escalator seated in front of a panoramic screen, while the individual in question is bombarded with images and more images. Within this context, the opinion of choice is only apparent, mapping from one channel to another, and foremost open to the manipulation, everybody is wired up. According to Carla Popper, a philosopher, in, the article, in his article on clocks and clouds, the computer is, like the machine, to be categorized as a hard system which, despite or quite by virtue of its on-off switches and relays which makes it more flexible to handle complex situations designed to control, top-down, control over the landscape, over human behavior and the human mind. The anticlimax that may manifest itself, and which is probably the only way out, is where the spectator is no longer capable of copying with the ever accelerating stream of images. It's the situation where the population falls prey to mass epilepsy, also and popularly called falling sickness. This notion allows us to redefine one of the expressions made again by Le Jean Le Corbusier. Good architecture is inscribed in the ground, as he tries to say, keep both your feet on the ground. As long as we have hands and feet and the mouth to eat, such banal elements as door, window, toilet and bed, table, room, remains a real part of architecture. Moreover, it appears that in many of psychological thrillers, these banal elements form a source of great tension and passion. I refer here to Rear Window in of 1954, a film by Alfred Hitchcock. It alludes to a discourse which contemporary architecture ironically has overlooked in its fascination with the image and with the cinema. 
It's here, finally, <laughs> where we arrive to describe the other domain which we called knowing. I already mentioned Karl Popper in relation to his article on clocks and clouds. In the example of the cloud, or a soap bubble, Karl Popper recognizes a real system which or with organic rather than mechanic characteristics. When the temperature rises, the bubble expands. The existence of systems as, as this entirely depends on the presence of an unstable boundary, the soap film, I love the ambiguity of that word, which regulates the interaction between what is both inside and outside the bubble. Thus, in case of the soap bubble, one can talk about control also, but this control is implicit to the interaction between inside and outside bilateral. It's entirely linked to feedback. On the slide we see a scientist searching for rules governing the minimal surface of real systems. Within the context of architecture and urbanism, with, which is our interest, the existence of such systems depend on the participation and interaction of many cells. That is more useful, that it is more useful to talk about a cloud, a cloud of raindrops or of midges, than about so bubble, and consequently about a topological system rather than an organic system. Some get by, others fall off. Coherence in such systems is achieved by local agreements of, of rules, as we can see in these uh, plans of pre-urban cities. It's uh, it's city of Beda. Uh, the cells, the plan is a generation of cells governed by simple rules. So. Um, as I said, that the coherence of such systems is achieved by local agreements or rules of play which are developed from below, from reality and not from above, out of abstraction. Examples are a cell next to a cell, or a cell placed in a cell, and which are experimented within the forthcoming projects as well. It should be clear that these cell in a cell or cell next to a cell relationships don't stick to any predominant shape whatsoever. Different questions should be thus be posed to address the shapes. It's no longer a question whether they are of good forms or bad forms or beautiful forms and what brings back the entire, entire rhetoric of pure intuition and seeing which belongs to the Newtonian legacy, or what language they speak. But whether these forms work or don't work, or work critically. And so, if knowing is a domain of the non-form and of an unspectacular architecture, the ultimate questions turn out to be then, which architecture? What happens in the design process when I take the rear facade as a recto verso copy of the front facade. This is what I have done in the project of uh, the Lambrecht House at Brussels. The rear and the front facade are a recto verso versions. The question is also what happens when I t take the rear facade as the same front facade placed on its head. This is a project for um, a moat house on the Java Island in Amsterdam. It's also the question what happens when I insert a public level in between the living level and the sleeping level, like uh, we have done in the design for the Dennis house. The trick is to avoid the trap of style, form, type, language. This game, with surfaces and facades, obtain an intellectual twist 
which strikes at the intermediate zone between front and rear facade. It leads to the more complex questions as how can I interchange sleeping level and living level without distorting the hierarchy from public to private. The solution of this puzzle balances on the uncertain relationship between seeing and knowing. Before proceeding in our actual projects, I want to turn once more to this theme of uncertainty. I want to articulate that this thesis is not a plea for a return to the traditional values. Traditional values. It's true, however, that all these constructs, such as a cell in a cell, a cell next to a cell, date from archaic times, which we called the undivided space, and were brought about by elaborate trial and error selection movements. It is this long-term endurance that ultimately meant that these principles were not able to adapt to modern times, to the radical change it entailed, and which ultimately led to the collapse of the form-function alliance. The 20th century rise and fall of the machine age, the Second World War stands out as a set highlight of the failure of the machine to serve man needs has blocked any possible return to a simple dialectical reunion between form and function. In a reverse sense, it does not imply either that every discussion on the issue of dwelling and on vernacular forms and on the kitchen is permanently closed. This is what I try to venture. It's our good fortune now that the issue of topology, cell next to a cell, a cell in a cell, is retaken in the psychoanalysis of children. According to Jean Piaget, a Swiss psycho psychologist, the child forms unstable concepts of proximity, separation, repetition, extension, and closure in the earliest stage of his intellectual development to come around to the world of the preposition in the child's minor use of language. Minor language because in this phase of development the child has not reached an equilibrium, let, an equilibrium yet between the accommodation of individual images and the assimilation of generalized and internalized schemes. Thus, within the context of the topological play and the subsequent use of prepositions in, out, regarding to that the characterization, the front door in the child's drawing, the obtained relationship between people, things and action is never quite certain. Now we're gonna step over to the projects ourselves. First, I, want, I must mention my curious relationship with this school, actually. Back in 1987, I took an MSc course at the Bartlett here in London. In early spring, a series of lectures was given by the late Robin Evans at the occasion of Le Corbusier's birthday one century ago, in 1887. On a certain moment, Robin Evans showed a slide taken from the booklet The Modeler, a work I was not familiar with at the time, showing what I believe are two variations on the standard Pythagorean model of perspective. I don't remember what Robin Evans said in association to it. What was important was that the slide resembled a model, a periscope, in the shape of a truncated pyramid, which I had made at home. Quite similarly, at the slide shows, I had constructed the model out of planes, distance at the rate of the golden section, in the hope it would show, when looking through it, equally distant squares. Afterwards, 
I would drop the golden section, being an inheritance of my former Catholic school in Ghent. What remained actually was the trapezoid shape of the model, and since Robin Evans had also shown slides of the chapel of Ronchamp, explaining how its three towers, light shafts derived from the one of Villa Hadrianus, which you see here on the slides, started to confuse these things at home. My, tra my trapezoid periscope collapsed with the periscope effect granted by Hadrianus Villa, and which Evans had shown. I then realized that the chapel of Ronchamp a kind of trapezoid space was quite built out of trapezia, seven of them, be it in a deformed manner in the way of the chapel of Hadrianus was constructed out of two boat squares. Likewise, my field of interest shifted from empty, pure, ideal, abstract geometry to planes which are deformed which therefore are more palpable and more real. As it appears, the trapezium that underlies Ronchamp's construction is deformed accordingly to the slope of the hill on which the church is built. <coughs> Number seven is a religious figure, but it can also be retraced to the seven levels of sublimation that underlie the poem, poem dans le droit, a series of lithographs which Le Corbusier had produced in the same period of Ronchamp's conception. The single central plate he calls fusion and expresses the struggle of the alchemist to perform miracles against the opposition of the authorities. These words, fusion, alchemy and sublimation are all words which relate to heat processes and set off my survey more in the new physics, chaos theory, quantum physics, notions as entropy. Away from the Newtonian scope where pure modern modernism was involved with, to ultimately come around to the schism between, schism between seeing and knowing. The way the trapezoid shape of Ronchamp opens toward the altar following the Pythagorean model of perspective, visual depth is diminished, which then in turn generates spiritual depth. At least that is what Le Corbusier must have ex expected and what suffices the idea of foreshortening. <coughs> visual depth in absentia crea creates spiritual depth. In retrospect, it must be said, many of my ideas, of many ideas in our projects originate from this single building and in this event back in 1987. So now we're gonna have a look at our build and, uh, under con and project which are under construction. This is the, the Cabrio house. The house is analogous to Villa Adrianus constructed, constructed out of two boat planes. A vertical boat plane is grafted on the forest edge. A horizontal boat plane relates to the surrounding fields. The house is built on the dividing line between woods and fields. Wood and fields. Consequently, going beyond the topological Play with, uh, topological play with planes. The most private room, that is the master bedroom, which you see here, is located concealed for the aisle in the space of overlap between horizontal and vertical. From and towards this space, all frontal views are blocked off. Only diagonal views remain possible. This datum contrasts with the remaining rooms where it's precisely the frontal views that are generated. <coughs> That's on the forest. This is the, the living space on the first floor. A second aspect is the entire sleeping level can be shut off 
so that the terrace level on the third, which you see here, and living level on the first, which we saw earlier, can work together. As one can notice, such items as chimney, window, carport, wall are present, but unlike the vernacular house, they are applied in the dis proportionate, they are applied in a disproportionate manner, as in a child, child's drawing. Cabrio, by the, by the way, means a crazy palindrome of cobra, being a brief and intense art movement just after the Second World War, and which focused on the children's drawings as well as drawings of the mentally retarded of the deformed animal figures as a way out of the philosophy of high, high abstract art on one hand and representative art which has obtained dogmatic proportions in academies and schools on the other hand. Cobra, by the way, is a contradiction of Copenhagen, Brussels and Amsterdam. Reversely, apart from the vernacular, the, there, there exists an opposite trend. The corner of uh, the initiated and the critiques to relate the cabrio house with the Citroha type of the house. This Citroha type of house. Truly, to the extent that cabrio means convertible, which allegorizes the French make of a car that's inspired Le Corbusier as being the vehicle, vehicle of rationality, cabrio in fact means comfort and cruising. This ambiguity of the house is essential. The house often frequented by architecture students, it has been on the house often frequented by architecture student, it has been on television in a very serious art program. It won an architecture prize and at the same time the house has been incorporated in a curio in a local treasure hunt. And a poster has been made, the pin-up of the month of, uh, an import of to promote a large bank with the slogan uh, such the dream house, such the bank, that's what you can, that's there in Dutch too. Then another project, that is the Van Beckley optics in Brussels, where the Cabrio house, as we have seen, is constructed out of two boat planes. Now Van Beckley's is marked by a single boat plane new that is slit in the existing structure, which is old, a block of apartment. As the optic shop is conceived in extension to an existing pharmacy as well, a separate entrance hall is positioned between old and new. The consequent separation between entrance hall, shops, space and workshop is then a thing we are familiar with, as it derives from the closed house. However, unlike the closed house type, the walls between three functions as pierced with open visual relationships, windows actually. Yeah, that was the earlier uh, image you see uh, at the... Uh, here at the bottom, that's the, the window of the, the front facade. Then a step deeper you see the window that gives <coughs> a relationship to the, the working area. And that's the, the working area itself. So it's, a genera it's a three windows next after each other. Each other. The effect is a slumbering contradiction between visual continuity and psychological barriers. And indeed, the client stays waiting in this entrance corridor, despite some hesitation uh, in the entrance hall, until he is invited in the shop by the optician. 
The team of classification initiated by splitting the shop up into cells is pursued on smaller scale. The collection of spectacles is stored in vertical racks, which roll in and out selectively accordingly to piece and class. The idea prevents the total view of spectacles from eclipsing into a mass blur within the limited space available. Classification is also pursued in the notion of framing on every scale. One of the ideas involved is to frame the notion of seeing itself. Seeing with a capital S is following our, our thesis quickly associated with the study of optics in the 15th century and which we in the optic shop have introduced by items such as the Renaissance copula with an oculus representing the eye of God. Here you see also the, um, the working area uh, through one of those windows into the into the the main uh, space of the of the shop. So um, so we have uh, introduced items such as Renaissance cupola with an oculus representing the eye of God. The intersection of action beneath this oculus, which divides the space in perfect symmetrical quadrants, representing a transcendental form of classification. We use pediments reflecting the arches of the Palladian villas, as you see on the slide. Since the study of optics also worked as an eye-opener to the study of dynamics, the motions within the heaven, we felt we should represent this as well. Hence the rolling racks, the rotating fitting table for glasses, the oversized wheels. The irony involved then is that the image of Renaissance Palazzo is zoomed into the scale of a boudoir or a tram stop. A tram is actually <coughs> a, a tram is stops actually in front of the of the shop which inspired us to use the same wheels as well as a flap door for the entrance, seen on the slide. The image of the tram stop allegorizes the modernist preoccupation with the ocean liner, sailing on international waters, one autonomous space. Rather, the metaphor of the tram imposes a local captive dynamism which is trapped to the era of Brussels. Next project is the Cruise House. This is a project for a photographic studio combined with a house situati situated in the suburban Antwerp. Since the studio absorb, absorbs half of the main building lot, our idea was to split the living facilities. Living would happen on a duple duplex on top of the studio. There. Sleeping in an annex in relation to the garden at the, the back. The critical <coughs> point of this inversion falls together with the double staircase. There. Double staircase which is positioned between the main building and the annex. That's then the main building and here that's left away should be the, the annex building. The staircase is double since a public and an exterior stair leading to the living quarters is projected through a glass wall. That's the, the glass wall. That's the, the public uh, staircase and that's the, the private one. To become a private staircase inside which via a detour leads down again the sleeping quarters. 
The issue involved is that despite the open visual relationship, the hierarchy from public to private is not distorted. The glass wall becomes the ultimate psychological dam. What we refer to as cellular, cellular composition earlier in the lecture is present in the pattern of the annex next to the main building. A cell next to a cell, but also a cell in a cell petro, pattern. This is uh, a view from the, the garden with the, the main building, the actual studio and the annex with there then the, the glass that makes uh, the division between the public and the, the interior staircase. So a central cylindrical, cylindrical cup board, that's what we see here, is projected throughout the several levels. The three-dimensional cylinder on the first level containing a staircase and a sanitary unit becomes a disc attaching to the ceiling of the photo studio. That's the, that's the photo <coughs> studio and that's the, the disc containing a rectangular concertina staircase, which we see there. The open slit in the three-dimensional cupboard on first level returns as a closed staircase on, on second level. The idea of projection of cupboards was enforced by the photo studio on ground level, a real open plan where we wanted to arrive at some visual coherence between the levels. It yields a split between the structure and seeing. Then, the Lambrecht House, also the Rector Versa project, is a house designed for an art critique and his family, family in Brussels. The main idea, Recto Verso, derives from the play with facades. As an example stands a Citroën type of house built by young Le Corbusier for the painter Guillet in Antwerp. This is the building. The Guillet house similar to the traditional row house, is built up along an interior corridor which connects rear to front facade and to which the rooms are attached. Following this organization, front and rear facades are symmetrical replicas. In the Lambrecht house, reversely, we experimented with a rectiversal rela relationship between front and rear facade. What, sub what subsequently happens is that the interior space splits. The circulation becomes loop-like. This you can see, you, there is no uh, corridor which goes right through to the, the rear, the garden side of the building, but there is a ship of a, a shift of directions within the, the building. The circulation becomes a loop, like I've said. What appears is a core and a boundary. One can actually make a walk, a walk around the block in the building. The core exists similar to the crusade out of a cupboard structure which is projected throughout the several levels. All functions are attached to it as a result of which the outer walls become free of the hanging for of works of art. In extension to this cupboard structure being a cell in a cell, an experiment is made on ground level with a series of oversized table, structure, table structures. You can see one in the garden there, the, the one in the interior is not seen, but on the earlier picture you can see a piece of it. And no. And it's not on this model, but in a preliminary design there was a table in the front garden 
also. In extension to this cupboard structures being a cell in a cell, an experiment is made on ground level with a series of oversight table structure. One demarcates the dining room, one the garden pavilion and another the carport, at least in the preliminary design in the front garden. This datum of repetition of wooden cells positions out, in and out, between rear and front garden should assert a visual relationship as an alternative of the separate vernacular of rear to front passage. There you see one of the, the tables. That's the, the table in the, the garden. And I see again a uh, view from the rear facade. <coughs> then next project is the Van Barenberg House. We return to the sleeping, sleeping living <coughs> inversion as seen in the cruise house, but which now follows from the location of the house, embedded in its entire length to a story high embankment. Sleeping happens on street level, living on garden level. The insertion of an open cell in between the closed cells, the house is presented as a repetition of V4 O equal blocks. You can see that scene as one block, another block, then the open block, and then uh, the four block where the kitchen is located. The four blocks articulate the looks and the wording of the cell house. It allows for an embankment part of the greater talus to link up the rear with the front garden throughout the house. Also, it allows for the insertion of a minimalistic plane, namely a 45 degrees roof that we see there, which was a town planning requirement and which in turn starts to interact with the embankment. So it's the 45 degree plane is parallel with <coughs> the slope of the embankment. The next project, yeah, here you see uh, a view from the street side. This is uh, the Peasons project. It's not uh, a private house with its uh, shoe import center. <coughs> Globally, the building consists of two similar volumes placed on top of each other in mutually shifted manner. It displays the administration open structure that's there underneath on ground level and the showroom that's the closed structure on the first level. That's there, the, the black box. The most active zone is located in the overlap between both levels, while it is demarcated once more by a ringed, ringy corridor. As a result, a distinction is achieved on ground level between a core, a cluster of offices, and an L-shaped peripheral area. That's that thing there. The letter contains the secondary functions, sanitary, kitchen, refectory, waiting room, patio. A first incisive uh, move towards the local is achieved by overlapping the ringy circulation wind with an intellectual rotation, a pinwheel structure which consists out of four red volumes and planes flying out of the center in the centrifugal force. That's a thing that you see in the interior that's not seen from the exterior. 
that's if you were seen from the the loading bits. That's one of a plane from uh, one leg of the, the pill pinwheel. One element makes links with the exterior, that's the canopy over there, the entrance owing. Another relates to the showroom, the encased monomal stairs. That's what you see there, that's the, the staircase. A third is a secondary zone, a red beam envelops the wires of it with the page here. Finally, a red volume projects over the loading platform. Yeah. That was that thing there which we saw on an earlier picture. Here you see that's the front canopy, that's <coughs> the volume of the staircase. That's the structure which which envelops the wife's office and the page so A private entrance is provided here via the underlying carport, at least in a preliminary design. The overlap of the ring circulation with a pinly structure supports a di certain dynamic. All offices are directly and unheroically linked to the ringy corridor. The corridor is difficult to see on this drawing, but it goes like this. With exception of the manager's office, which pierces through the round, wo the round walk to cut it up in two pieces. That's the manager's office. All offices open up to each other on the base of a semi-glazed, semi-wall pattern, with exception again of the manager's office. Where site remains entirely blocked off, only some arbitrary diagonal slits give a glance in and out the red volume. The one and the other should imply that the manager is wholly in control of the business. <coughs> this is a view of the uh, the staircase which goes to the second level, the showroom. This is the diagonal views which you get from the entrance hall through all the office spaces. That's just the detail. That's the uh, ringy corridor. That's the other part of the corridor. This is a view through the patio to the upper showroom space. That's just detail. That's uh, also a view toward the entrance hall from the offices. Yeah. Next. Uh, a second act to anticipate the local is provided by cellular composition. The building is conceived as a generation of open and closed cell shoe boxes. You can see that that are all uh, four by four by eight meter boxes. Here is an open cell which is placed on the, the other side that became the caretaker house. So and which is forwarded by one cell in particular that is shifted out the main cluster, that's that one there, thus making the page show to appear and placed next to the building over there to mark the caretaker's home. At stake is a further elaboration of the themes of open closed, global local, seen hidden which have been experimental in the previous projects. 
The combination of pinwheel structures, open closed cellular clusters, ringy corridors is also seen in two post-war buildings designed by Le Corbusier in his design for a hospital in Venice, here on the slide. The combination of the pinwheel and ringy circulation is incorporated to distinguish between the several diseases and or their treatment. In the center of the building, determined by the regulating diagram, a pinwheel configuration of cells is lifted out in order to place it in a twisted manner next to the building that you see over there. It's a deed which gives insight in the composition of the building. The generative rule is placed outside and in front of the building. It also attempts to bridge the difference of scale between the large hospital and the finer grain of the surrounding city of Venice. A second building at stake in is the Monastery of La Tourette, which is very much related to the plan of the Venetian hospital despite the formal difference. Both buildings are constructed on the same regulating diagram of lines, which you see here. Analogously, the most public space in La Tourette is located in the center of the building demarcated by the regulating grid. So that's the, that's the plan of uh, La Tourette. <coughs> and here we made uh, the scheme of the regulating composition. And that's the scheme of the regulating com composition of the design of Le Corbusier for the, Venice, for the hospital in Venice. So, um, so analogously, the most public space in La Tourette is uh, that's uh, no, yeah, there. Most public space is located uh, in the center of the building, demarcating by the regulating grid. It's the meeting hall in front of the refectory. It's the only spot which allows for social contact. La Tourette therefore provides us with a variation on the theme of open, closed cellular composition, which is entirely in the virtual interfacial. So, at stake is a further elaboration on the themes of open, closed, global, local, seen, hidden, which we have been experimented in previous projects. The same teams are employed to insert the windows in the Peasons project that you can see that's the openings of the windows. Holes are cut out of the upper closed mass, the showroom, in order to become <coughs> projected in solid wall sequences on ground level. Uh, that's maybe more difficult to see, but the solid masses uh, are, are uh, behind the glass. It's not visible on the, the elevation. In order to become projected in solid wall seekers on ground level, which are positioned behind the continuous glass wall. This sort of projection allows for local vertical stages in a building which is globally horizontal layered. Then that's uh, another next project. It's the Sloten 1 project. The Sloten 1 project was a close competition for a series of eight small islands containing eight to four houses each. It was written out by the city of Amsterdam as a finale of the large new housing scheme, New Sloten. The city forms the, link, the last link, the, tu the touchstone which with the old village of Sloten. The problem is less simple than direct. However, to relate vernacular and modern, 
individual houses with large linear housing, pitched roof on one hand with flat roofs on the other. We came up with the idea to copulate two types of houses, a modern one, the white type, and an organic one, the black type, in either length, height or breadth. Thus, in a variety of building, thus a variety of building is granted, which keeps the middle between the individual collective dichotomy, dichotomy of building. As a result, over more of this coupling, the point of attention moves away from the autonomously architecture space to the interface between the two houses, where the two houses meet or mate. The mutual entrances are inserted here. Within this context, the application of double staircases, living sleepy inversion is at its best. Within the combination of each pair, for instance, it is not evident at all for the outsider which stair, which entrance party leads to which house. Under the slogan, things are not always what they appear to be, the act of coupling is pursued further to destabilize the formal typology of both house types. The organic type, which with all its references to broad chimneys and cantilevers become no more than an envelope wrapped around a pinwheel structure of spaces. It's a modern property. Cellular composition, which is quickly associated to organical architecture, is characterized by black volumes, mostly the kitchen or bathroom, which pierce through the, fl the flat blank space of the modern type. Along the play with primary criteria as wall, roof, chimney, cell, which constitute the vernacular house, is never far away. Then, then we got the Sloten, the Sloten 2 project. This is the project which is actually going to be built. In the meanwhile, the budget was fixed as well as the location on the edge of the site, being the lot of eight small islands and which yielded the offspring of the design. The Dutch word op zee means both a side or and up side or above in English. Within the op zee project, the zee house site is a copy of the op house up turned on its side. Accordingly, the split level in the op house is repeated in the receding facade of the zee house. At this point, I'm entitled to an extra explanation. In the first round of the competition, the commission for each of the eight participants was to make a design for both a small four houses and a large island, eight houses. The assignment for the small island, we choose to pass through a Chicago-based team, Linda Polari and Robert Somal. The main theme of their project then was to articulate the free section in contrast to the modern free plan and which amounted into three to four stories high houses looking out onto the wider context. The height, however, appeared to be one of the weaknesses of the project. Who can blame the Chicago-based team after all? According to the jury, the project broke the budget as well as the building regulations. The jury, however, being compromised to make a choice between large and small island, eventually chose the larger island to be executed, which inspired Bob Somal to the say, a monolithic and singular whole fallen apart after inspection. Our Sloten 2 project picks up the pieces again. In the up house, 
that's the the up house, the the one that's sloping, and that's the the house or the side house. In the up house, the section is uh, dominant, be it restricted to two and a half level. However, firm through its juxtaposition to the Zé house, where the plan is most the better the plan is most dominant. Subsequently, the topological play between up and side is pursued to define windows and wall sequences. Two principles are generated. All the wall surfaces which are placed on the orthogonal grid that is imposed on the island are colored white and spread out from the Zé house. All the wall surfaces located as much both to up and side house which are shifted from the orthogonal grid as much in plan as in section spread out from the up house and are colored black. In all shifted and black wall sequences windows are inserted in an upstanding manner. In all orthogonal white wall, sequ wall sequences, windows are cut out in a horizontal level. You can, oh. you can see that's the horizontal windows there too. That's the, the vertical windows. There you see the horizontal white windows there too. What's that vertical one doing there in the middle? You mean? A white one. That, that's, there's one, just one vertical uh, division if you meaning that. I meant the one between the Z and the Z. This is, uh, I think that that's, that's the model itself, that's not right mate in that spot. That's it the principle that counts. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's changed on that it's it's not like that in the final design. <laughs> it's the principle that's count. <laughs> when you start to realize and build those kinds of then you have, uh, you have to uh, start some, I mean, the building process is sort of different than designing them, those houses. So you have to start to modify, to accommodate to... All the building regulations in the, in the Netherlands, they have a booklet like that, yeah. Yeah. to which the project has to be adjusted. Holland is a very tough country to build. They have such a large uh, regulation book where they um, have regulations for um, the, wide of the, the width of the stairs and uh, the amount of glass that can be that is allowed in, in, the, in the entire block. I think it's 25% maximum of the entire surface of the house, which can be glass, I means changing that very much. I mean, it's, it's, this is all very, these are all very new regulations. Mm. It's the, the problem is to work with those items and with those principles, and which amounts in, in, in a very sober architecture, where you we have to play with those simple things. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's seen then as some side remarks. But I also have something left to say about this project. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, that's more about the in the overall organization of the whole concept of the island. Here we had uh, again a kind of topological play um, is also wi which within the configuration of the four pair of houses 
uh, is placed on the island, the up house becomes the inner house of the island in that those four and focuses in a prospectical manner on the water surrounding the island. Then the say houses become <coughs> the outer houses out and locks out in a panoramic manner across the surrounding fields. Op Zij, by the way, is also the name of an erotic magazine in Holland. A side <laughs> remark. Unlike the Slot One project, where copulation was a central topic and which showed to be a fertile, gr fertile ground to experiment with, our teams, as seeing knowing inversion, double staircase. Um, in Sloten 2, no such incisive acts were granted. The strong building regulations, as we've said, don't allow for it. Also, the sales managers feel insecure about the commercialization of the houses. Gender, therefore, in the Sloten 2 is only present in a symbolic manner. The female symbol, known as a circle on top of a cross mark, is to be associated with the Zé house, the white one, and placed on an orthogonal grid. <coughs> the male symbol, the circle, the circle with an arrow standing aloof, can be associated with the up house, which is black, upright, shifted uh, from the grid. Yeah, I think that was the last slide. <laughs> Thank you. offered tomorrow morning to kind of meet uh, with students or indeed anyone who's come uh, and to discuss any of the questions they might have uh, or points they'd like to kind of raise about the work. Uh, so maybe it would be a good idea um, if people who could come uh, could let me know before they leave this evening. Um, I think that would kind of be more sort of productive than uh, an exchange now. Um, so it only remains to me to thank you very much indeed for a fascinating evening. Thank you. Thank you.